Thank you. I'll connect you now. Hey, uh, not sure of any others, but let's go ahead and get started. Chip. Uh, Chip Morrill with the Thomas Jefferson Planning District and the NPO. Morgan Butler, Southern Environmental Law Center. Mark Graham, Albemarle County. Chris Engel, City of Charlottesville. Joel. Joel Nunzio, VDOT, uh, Charlottesville Residency. Dave Covington, VDOT, Charlottesville Residency. Debbie Messina, Phil Chiquette Company. Clint McCullough, VDOT, IT Support. John Lynch, Culpeper District, VDOT. Lou Hatter, VDOT Communications. All righty. Um, Sorry. Okay, it's all right. It's all right. Uh, at our last meeting, we had again about the same number of uh, viewers. Uh, fewer streams. Remember January, we had the secretary and commissioner here, and uh, folks that did tune in stayed on a little bit, a little bit longer. Okay. Linda, go ahead. Uh, from the inbox and phone calls over the last month, 11 emails and phone calls, uh, one person suggested that there be an eastern connector or, uh, to route 616 and 22, and they were furnished with information about VDOT's transportation planning process. Uh, one asked about when the street lights will be uh, on at Hollymead Town Center. At the roundabout, I think they were advised that the lights would come on when the roundabout was was open. Uh, Forest Lakes uh, homeowner commented about trash in the wooded area behind their property. The trash was picked up. Uh, trash barrels were placed to help minimize any loose trash, and some fencing was also put up to keep trash from blowing into that into that area. So we appreciate Lane Corman responding to that. One commented about traffic light timing on 29 from polo grounds to hydraulic causing causing delays. Uh, you know, we're going to I think we're just going to continue to get these comments for a while until all construction is finished and until phase 2 of the signal program goes into place, which Joel is going to brief you on phase two uh, later in the agenda. One suggested that there be a yield sign on Rye Road West turning north on Route 29, and we just don't have plans to do that. That is that continuous right turn that was viewed by you and, and by VDOT as an important element of keeping traffic moving through there. If you remember those, uh, those delineators, are up in that lane. Today, I don't think we've had, we haven't had any issues with the operation of that continuous right turn. So it's like other items, we keep an eye on it, but we're not gonna, we are not don't plan on taking any action there as far as a yield sign. Uh, one commented about uh, contractors parking in a driveway without permission, and we got that taken care of, reminded them that that's a no can do. Uh, one uh, really asked ask about the landscaping plan, was provided the plan, and expressed an opinion that it just wasn't adequate and wanted more planting. Uh, the hardwood trees have been planted in this area. According to the plan, there's no, there's no plan to do more. There might be some remaining trees that we might consider for this area as long as they don't interfere with the hog heart. If they were available and if we put them here, it would be only if they were deemed not to interfere with the hardwood. Is that right, Dave? Yeah, we've got, we planted some really nice red oaks in that area and we don't want to, they were asking for a very specific type of evergreen in size, but I told Lane Corman, if you have an opportunity where you can move some evergreens from somewhere else, but keep them away from those uh, red oaks because they will shade them out. They won't get sufficient sunlight. So there, there may be some evergreens to get planted in that location. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
One uh, commented that night, nightly closures of Ashwood were affecting fire rescue response times and noted that the message board didn't provide adequate information about how long that closure would last, but the comment came on the last day of that particular closure. Uh, Lou? And that, that comment was actually from the, the uh, fire rescue supervisor oh, okay. out of the Hollymead station. Um, and what I did, I added him in on our, I was sending it to fire rescue chief folks, but right. I added him in on okay. our uh, distribution list. So good. He's getting the information directly, so he knows. Good. Very good. Having any closures that'll adjust. So he knows about these closures moving up now to Richwood Mobile Homes and to North and South Yes, Hollywood. sir. He's been advised. Very him. good. Very good, Lou. Very good. Thank you. Uh, one comment about hitting a large uh, bumpy area in the work zone on 29 North, and I think that was a uh, steel plate over a train. Yeah, that was a plate that wasn't recessed well enough that's since been taken care of. Okay. Um, this is actually kind of a repeat comment and came in two places about doing additional clearing uh, in the, around the Holly, Holly Mead Townhouse Citizens Association homes outside of the right of way. I think we touched on this in February, but we don't have any agreement as part of any right of way negotiations to clear brush outside of the right of way, and we're not going to be we're not going to be doing that. I mean, I can understand maybe somebody making that ask. But that's not something that uh, is part of any agreement that was made. I don't know if there's some misunderstanding there, uh, but I think we've responded a couple times now that we've cleared what we were going to clear, and we won't be clearing beyond the limits of the of the right of way. Uh, one ask about a, an adjustment in the grade uh, at Burkmar Drive and. Uh, Rio intersection where that now a flashing yellow. And Dave, I'm gonna ask you to maybe speak to that with you or Joel a little bit more. We don't plan on making any adjustments in the grade there, I don't believe. No, that's not part of the project. But part of the project was because we knew that that was an aging signal system, four bolt pole, we're upgrading all this. We included bolt poles. reconstruction of that uh, signal as part of the contract. Right. And in doing that, our uh, District traffic engineer asked if we could also include the flashing yellow left arrow. Um, before we installed that, there was a left turn yield on green. So the same situation was there, um, you know, safety wise. I don't think. As far as the road grade, grade nothing's changed. We've not changed yeah. it. We don't plan on changing it as part of this project. That, that would be a fairly large project in and of itself. Okay. Um, Hillsdale, uh, Jeanette got uh, 10, 10 e emails uh, over the last month, and Jeanette, holler out if I, Jeanette, you're welcome to sit up here, but holler out if I miss anything or not. Uh, one comment about the speed of construction trucks, and this actually, I think, turned out to be some utility. We have Lewis upgrading their facility right in the same place that we're doing the sanitary sewer upgrade. So every time I get a comment about construction trucks, everyone kind of points at each other, so I just comment to both of them. To, to both of them. Okay. Thank you. Same uh, There was one request for the timeline regarding the removal of shrubbery uh, at the Hampton Inn, and that timeline was provided. Uh, Two thank yous for the traffic alerts. Uh, there was one request for a local traffic only sign and uh, put out a variable message sign to handle, to handle that particular issue. Uh, one request that vehicles not use private parking lots for turnarounds and the same deal there. Uh, Jeanette notified both contractors that shouldn't be, should be doing that, not to do that. One request for uh, notice of on any restrictions for on-street parking for events at the senior center, and that will be provided in advance of, of any of those types of restrictions. 
There was one request for some old street signs that uh, the contractor provided to whoever requested them. So I don't guess Jeanette could use them anywhere else in the city. No, mine's no. aren't going away. Yeah. Uh, there was one request for just to be on the, uh, on the list for traffic alerts, and that was taken care of. And uh, one uh, request on the construction update to clarify an item on the construction update that went out a bit ago, and that clarification was provided. There's still a healthy amount of activity, you know, people people watching what's what's going on here. Any issues with those? Let's go on. Still no new postings on the provide input piece. Uh, four calls, emails and calls to the project hotline. One was that issue again about the additional clearing, and we already commented on that. Uh, four slates commented about some litter, and all of that was, uh, was cleaned up. I know that... Uh, that's not something people should have to complain about. Um, unfortunately, it it is from time to time <laughs> when contractors do their, at least I can say these guys, I think, have been doing their best not to let that be a problem. Uh, and of course, it's not always all from them either, but uh, appreciate the contractors getting on that and doing a little cleanup. The efficiency apartments on 29 northbound asked for some additional stone. I think in that particular case, went and took a look at it, didn't see the immediate need for additional stone. That's, that's correct. It was more of a tracking of mud across the driveway than it was a stone issue. And we're monitoring that regularly. Because I know you play some additional stone we put some more than one occasion. Several, probably a month or more ago. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then just the continual communications with folks about interest closures and uh, and detours up on Route 29 widening project. So, uh, fr frankly, it's it's good to see people continuing to be engaged as these projects are uh, are wrapping up or getting close to wrap up, or in Jeanette's case, getting. Midway of wrapping up. Um, report on some feedback we've got from you all. Morgan particularly has asked a couple times about a uh, update on the Lynchburg to DC train, and we thought we had it lined up for March, but as it turns out, Jennifer Mitchell, the director of DRPT, is meeting today with Norfolk Southern to discuss this uh, subject. So actually, I said a representative from DRPT would be here at the April 20th meeting. It should be Jennifer, uh, absent anything going haywire with her uh, with her schedule. But we will have somebody here to get an update on where that stands at our April April meeting. Um, Henry had asked about additional lighting underneath that bridge at the Amtrak station. We did uh, get that comment over to uh, Tony Edwards at the city, and he's going to make sure the right people have it to take a look at and uh, and evaluate evaluate that comment. Um, Phil, Phil, if I can just say too, we'll mention that tomorrow. Chris and I are in a meeting with Amtrak, the RPT, the city. Um, okay. So the you know see if yeah, we're good. in agreement. Yeah, it might, good. It might help out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pete Borchis uh, sent a note yesterday and uh, asked uh, if we could add um, the best buy ramp to our accident data tracking that we've been doing over the last several several months. And re really, I thought that was a, a good a good comment. He said a couple of people had asked him about it, who had seen presentations ab about the tracking that we were doing. Touch base with Joel on that, and I think at the April meeting we'll we'll have just another column tracking that same timeline for the limits of the of the Best Buy ramp of the Best Buy ramp project. Um, at more than one earlier meeting, we talked about weaving at the Rio GSI. 
and we've continued to look at that and uh, and just frankly continue to not observe any unusual situation there that's not present anywhere where there's a change of lanes to make, whether they be grade separated or four or six lanes uh, uh, at, at grade. But we did notice, and I think Joel may have talked about that accident that occurred um, just outside of the speedway on, go ahead to the next slide. South, this is from the bridge looking looking south. Speedway is over here. And right there in the corner, you see this authorized vehicle only sign. And at the end of this little, uh, at the end of this barrier is where an authorized vehicle could do a flip off the local lanes into the into the northbound lanes. Well, excuse me, a flip from the southbound lanes, southbound through lanes, into the northbound through lanes. And there was an accident, right, Joel? One of the recorded accidents, or was this just an observation you yeah. saw? Two. 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 There were two crashes at the median and one here in this right lane. From folks going across the local lanes, across the southbound through lanes, through the authorized vehicle only turn to go north on Route 29. <coughs> now that is a little bit of an abnormal <laughs> situation. <laughs> yeah, it was chip <laughs> No, 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 it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Let's back that out. But uh, Joel, Dave, and uh, Lou went out and took a look at this. And if you if you go by there now, you'll notice in this Gore area. There are a set of delineators to keep from one from coming out of that entrance and making that movement uh, again. And go to the next slide. So yeah, again, looking looking south, the speedways over here. So it provides more of a clear delineation that hey, if you're if you're coming out of this entrance. You need to go on down the local lanes and then merge back in to the two to three lanes. I think that was a good call on on their part and the right thing to do in that particular that, area. To me, it doesn't strike me as someone who was confused. It looks like someone who was pulling out only places. Yeah, I don't think that had much to do with confusion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they, but a very dangerous situation for people who are are doing the right thing. And uh, yeah, I think that made an abundance of sense there. The traffic here is about 60% in the through lanes, right Dave? About 60% in the through lanes, 40% in the local lanes, which gets back to that issue of, well, should we, should we put up signs that say use the right, that emphasize if you're local, use the right two lanes. And we've talked about that uh, a lot and keep coming back to the same spot that we really don't want to do, to do that. Because 60% of the traffic is looking to go through the, through the through lanes, use the through lanes. And because we just haven't observed, we haven't observed, have we observed weaving and merging? Well, of course, because people are weaving and merging to get into proper proper lanes, but not anything uh, unusual. We keep looking at it. Uh, we also haven't had any comments about that for uh, for a couple of meetings now, so I'm not. I don't take anything away from that, other than we haven't had any comments about it for uh, for a couple of months, and I'm sure that we didn't hear from the person who flipped around the uh, area to go across four lanes of traffic. We did. It's a did. What's that? The one that... Yeah. The, illegal movement? The, the police report. He or she they knew. admitted they weren't supposed to be. We had, we've had three crashes here. Two of them tried to get through that gap there, and one of them, the reason the delineators are in this location instead of 
where the authorized vehicles are, because there was one crash that occurred, someone pulled out of the speedway into the through lanes southbound, and you don't have a great sight distance. So we didn't want either one of those movements. That one might have been confusion, but the other, one of the other two that actually shot that gap there said they knew they weren't supposed to do it, but they're doing it anyway, and the other one didn't identify that. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything on your mind as far as an agenda item for the next meeting? Chris? Mark? No agenda item, but just want to mention with, with the hydraulic project taking off, had the opportunity to talk to a lot more people recently mm -hmm. um, on different issues. Lots of positive comments, mm -hmm. but I would say two to one, Best Buy seems to be the most appreciated improvement. Um, just over and over of people who live or travel that area, uh -huh. the two lanes, they comment how much more, more easy it is to travel. Well, good. Um, it's been especially over the last couple of weeks. Well, I guess that one was on the books, too, for a long time, wasn't it? So, uh, yeah, yeah. Good. That's good to know. Thank you. Thank you. As far as uh, milestones go, uh, you know everything moving to toward completion as it as it should on uh, 29 and Burkmar. Still looking at an early an early completion before uh, before July. So that'll that'll be here before before we know it. Uh, a big push on the water line, relocation, and on additional paving. Uh, on uh, on Hillsdale, Hillsdale did get, if you remember one time we said we re-baselined the sun, <coughs> did schedule, and we made a few adjustments in this milestone chart based on the re-baseline schedule. Uh, Hillsdale just approved the re-baseline schedule from their contract contractor that still shows October is it 30th or 31st? 30th. 30th. Uh, completion date. This Greenbrier uh, signal that, that went, uh, signal infrastructure that went red here uh, based on the old schedule will will move and will relocate that activity uh, accordingly. The retaining wall was a little late in wrapping up at Pepsi, but that is wrapped up now. Um, you, Chris was mentioning that he's driven a few times on that uh, piece that's open. Uh, Debbie and I drove up and down a bunch last time we were out here last week. So uh, work, uh, work progressing, and we'll take a look at that read baseline schedule. And to the extent that we need to move or expand any of these items on Hillsdale, we will uh, we will do that. Dave? Oh, I did notice, unfortunately I always notice something while I'm sitting here. It says agenda item six, Route 29 Solutions Project Updates, continue. Well, just make believe that continued isn't there until you see the next slide. <laughs> my, my bad. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. A quick update on 29-250. As we talked a little bit, we, we've already started the landscaping. That's underway. Um, that'll continue probably another week or two. I don't think they got a whole lot done this week due to the frozen ground, freezing temperatures. Uh, but that's going along just fine. We've got a picture to look at on it in a minute. Um, but the wall staining. That will begin very shortly. Actually, we, we had just this morning a little change to this schedule. Um, they pushed it back one week due to freezing temperatures. So that is a temperature sensitive activity, not only because of the daytime temperatures when they're staining, but they can't have the stain freezing at night. They keep that on site. So they pushed that back to the 27th. They're kind of going to be flip-flopping back and forth between the Burkmar project and 29 widening and sometimes doing both at the same time. Uh, so it's going to be in the general vicinity of March 27th, uh, maybe a couple days later. Uh, but that that work will last approximately one month. So one month from the 27th, we should have 
29,250 done, the landscaping as well as the staining. Um, but again, both of these are subject to the weather. If we get a week of rain, there's no way that they can do the staining. I think we'll be in the clear for landscaping. So. Can you remind me again, do you guys anticipate there being any lane closures resulting from that? Yeah, with the wall staining, when they have to do the front faces of the walls, um, there will be, they will need one lane to be closed on, it's not a 250 lane, but coming up the ramp. So you'll have to close that right lane to give them enough, enough buffer from the through traffic. Uh, and then all, when they jump over to the other side, they'll work off the shoulder coming up the ramp. But when they get to the last 150 feet on the south side of 250, they'll have to do a lane closure and bring that ramp in sooner. So everything will remain open with the exception of that one short period. We're thinking two days from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So they have the same lane closure restrictions as Fielder's Choice did when they were constructing the project. So this is a picture. This is the stormwater basin for the 29250 project in that loop ramp in the southwest quadrant. And you can see here that the bushes are pretty prevalent. They kind of jump out at you, but then they've got uh, some grasses planted in there as well. And if we jump to the next picture, I think we've got one on the other side. So they're kind of doing this whole area, kind of a re almost a reforestation of uh, this area, uh, part of the landscaping plan. Uh, those are the only ones I've stopped and took pictures of, but they're also planting in the media now, uh, moving up, up 29. And I think we looked at that landscaping plan a while back. Yeah. So you can kind of get a feel for how much vegetation is going in the media. And the next slide, does anybody have any questions, other questions about that? Okay. So Route 29 widening, as Phil mentioned, this project is really coming along and starting to take shape. Uh, they had a, uh, some kind of big activities that were very labor intensive that have dragged on for a little while. Jack and Paul comes to mind as one. But this week, finalizing ponds two and three. Um, I hope they get pond three finalized this week, but they did hit rock again. So they're working on that. Not a problem, it just will slow things down a little bit. Uh, storm sewer installations are continuing, getting close to being wrapped up. Uh, a lot of grading work on the North Mound Lane side, uh, finishing that, the grading for the curve. So this is fine grading for the curve installations, uh, the subgrade before the stone gets put in, and the shared use path. Uh, phase four water main uh, northern crossing uh, prep. So they're getting ready for that. They ran into rock as they were moving up toward the very northern part of that before they cross over the road, or cross beneath the road, I guess I should say. Um, not stopping them, just slowing them down a little bit, but that we kind of knew there would be some rock up there. The phase three water main testing occurred this week. Uh, it will continue into next week. There's a whole like five step process to commissioning a water main. Uh, so they're going through that. Some of the testing takes about three days to get results back for bacteria and things like that. Um, but one thing I do want to mention on the northern crossing and on the southern crossing of the water main, those casing pipes are already there. So that, that's a, at least, a, excuse me, the northern casing pipe is there. The southern casing pipe needs to extend across the northbound lanes. So the majority of that's done. We're not going to be digging a huge trench across the north side of 29. Um, structure 92, that was the, the jack and board that's been dragging on and on and on, where they hit a lot of rock. and uh, They got to a point where they're outside of the roadway prism now. So it's such a long jack and board that they've actually not been able to push the pipe any further. So now they're going to open cut and install the rest of the pipe, which is once they get the open cut done, then it'll be a much faster operation. So they're just about done with that structure 92, but they're actually demobilizing all their jack and board equipment. So we won't be talking about jack and boards anymore, um, but 92 is being open cut. Under drain installation continues throughout the northbound lane section and installing these signal and light poles at Holly Mead. Slowed down a little again because of rock up there, but they must do that today, so we'll get the foundation for the Holly light pole in this week and then the pole installation over the next two weeks. This is the northern section of the water, mine, water main relocation. So what you see to the right is the Mooney's open field, and just behind this picture to the right is Holly Mead Town Center. So that's, that's where they're at right now, so they're at the very northern end. I think they just have a couple hundred more feet to go until they get to that crossing point. The next picture kind of steps around that and just looks down into this operation. And you see we've got a 
uh, a rock head on that excavator where they're chipping the rock out of that trench. So it's a little bit of a slow, painful process, but they're used to it by now. So uh, what's coming up over the next couple of weeks, or excuse me, this week's lane closures, uh, I don't believe they've done any single nighttime lane closures, single lane closures. Don't think they have any plan for tonight or tomorrow night either. Um, but Tuesday night of this week, they did close the uh, exit from South Holly Mead on the 29, the entrance and exit to run the storm sewer across that. Uh, they got that wrapped up Tuesday night. They did a short detour up to North Holly Mead, so that went really well. Didn't have any issues. So that's back over. So over the next two weeks, what's coming up? Grading and placing stone on the shared juice path. You know, it's a good time when we start start talking about shared juice path installation. Uh, finalizing pond two, uh, I would expect that pond three would be added to that as well, since they hit rock just this morning. Uh, subgrade and curb uh, grading and stone placement. Uh, nighttime closures of the intersections at Ashwood and South Hollymead. This is pushed back to March, the evening of March 31st. They're going to close both of those, do a detour, and actually do the, what we call a reconstruction of that intersection. So that's a big paving operation. They have to build up the existing asphalt there. So they'll do the, all that in one night on a Friday night and then have it open on Saturday morning. So right now it's scheduled for the 31st of this month. Storm sewer installations will continue. Phase four water main will be wrapping up over the next two weeks. Um, I expect that the water main will be installed by the end of this month, and then that whole process of connecting to the existing main, making sure everything is flushed and, and decontaminated, and we'll probably have everything switched over to the new water main by the second or third week in April. So we can see the light at the end of the tunnel on that. That reduces our risk of that old existing water main, something happening with that. So we're looking forward to that. The curb and gutter installation. So this is what I was talking about, the Ashwood and uh, North Holly Mead intersections on the 31st, detouring to South Holly Mead. Okay, any questions on 29 line? All right. So Burp Bar Extended is coming along uh, well also. Uh, fine grading for curb installation. This is primarily the southern section south of the river, and then a couple of sections uh, just north of the river where they were bringing that grade down last time we met. Uh, to, you know, coming off the bridge, uh, cutting the subgrade at the roundabout at Hilton Heights. Uh, stone placement north of the bridge, so they're getting that base stone put in. Uh, storm sewer con construction continues primarily south of the river. Under drain installation, curb and gutter, and ground mounted sign installation. So this is a picture of some of the landscaping, just to kind of show you what what's going on out there. You can see the trees that have been added on the tops of the slopes. There are quite a few trees along the Mar, so I think as we um, not only see the trees planted, but as we get into the spring and start seeing them bloom, it'll, it'll really come to shape pretty nicely. This is a picture taken on the bridge, and, and kind of, I wanted everybody just to see, you know, we talk about parapet walls, we talk about barrier walls, um, to get an idea of, of what these look like. So as of today, they're pouring the very last section of parapet wall today. And that you can see that on the right hand side there that has the same pattern and will be staying uh, the same as Rio. Uh, and the barrier wall, which is kind of in the middle, that separates the shared juice pass, path from the roadway portion of the bridge. Uh, they, they'll start pulling that late next week. Um, they're telling me they're going to do it in two pours. So, possibly in the next week and a half, the barrier walls will be done. They'll do the terminal walls, they'll come in and stain them. Uh, put the railings on, and the bridge will pretty much be done at that point. And then you can see some of the progress they've made on the excavation north of the, the bridge. That's pretty close to uh, finished grade there. So they're putting the stone on that and getting that ready for asphalt over the next couple weeks. So no, no lane closures this week. Uh, we're not expecting any. Well, actually, we do have one on the two-week look ahead, and I'll get to that in a moment. Roundabout trench asphalt, so we've got three trenches going across Barkmar and Hilton Heights right now where we have various things, storm sewer, water main extensions that had to be put in where the roundabout goes in. Um, that asphalt will be starting next week. Everything got pushed back a week because we had such low temperatures this week. 
uh, fine grading the roadway and sidewalk, uh, grading for curb and gutter, kind of same thing that's been going on this week. Parapet and barrier wall construction continues next week. Storm sewers, under drains, curb and gutter, uh, parapet railing installation starts next week, and ground mounted signs continue next week. So now we get to upcoming uh, lane closure. The evenings of March 20th and 21st, they'll do a nighttime lane closure with a flagger there because uh, they'll come in and they'll pave those uh, trenches across the road. So get asphalt back on those. Pretty quick operation, probably won't last all night, probably three or four hours. That's what we're looking at. It. Any questions on Burkmar? Yeah, I've got a yeah, question that's probably more than just Burkmar, but talking about the steam that's going on at 250 bypass and this project as well. Help me remember, I recall there had been some question about whether staining at Rio looked like it was just two colors. That been, I know there was some question about what the mix of colors were, but it looked like a final product. Maybe there were only two different variations. And I think maybe when we left off, there was someone who was going to check into that because the, what they were trying to emulate at the metal computer change looked like there was a wider array of colors used. Did we ever get to the like, we didn't filter answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, we, the, we I'm the, Dave and I are both the color consultants. <laughs> on, if it's black or white, we got it covered. I think there are actually six different six colors, yeah. six different shades, as well as the what's that first coat? The, the, the that rocks six on. includes includes the includes the base includes the base. And one of the one of the misconceptions I think is they don't paint so to speak six different rocks six different colors. They're kind of overlapped and a little bit dabbed here, a little bit dabbed there. Right. Um, I know that we just had our, our pre-construction meeting yesterday about that staining of the 29250 walls, and I know Jeanette was there uh, kind of talking about how do we make it look a little bit more like McIntyre, and the thing that I couldn't offer, and, and maybe Jeanette hit the nail right on the head here, is that first of all, we have a different rock pattern, so the rock sizes are larger on Rio. It, all of these projects compared to McIntyre. But the other thing is that, um, I think, Jeanette, you mentioned that the grays tend to not be... Like a brown wash. Brown. Yeah, so awesome. kind of, yeah, try to dull the grays down a little bit because they kind of stick out at you as Raya. So that's what we're going to do. And, I, and what we talked about doing was go ahead and do the first section of 29250 and Jeanette, come out and look at it and see what you think. Me looking at it, I can't tell. And you know, see, do we need to make an adjustment on continuing the rest of it to make things blend in a little more regional? Morgan, I think this is a little. So it it's very intensive with a lot of hand staining right. work, and a little different than you know uh, number ten blue from from the right, paint right. store. Uh, but but we have heard that, and I know Jeanette and Dave, like you said, just met yesterday. Good. So this basically, there's an effort to convince them to do it a little more like they did at Meadow Creek in terms of the stain. Well, McIntyre, because McIntyre is different than Meadow Creek. Yeah, because yeah, remember, yeah. we went. <laughs> yeah. we, right, start at the base. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We're it's definitely good. looking to see what we can do. Now, one of the benefits here is this will be done during the daytime. Whereas at Rio, yeah, um, I don't know how they even did what they did at night, uh, quite honestly, because a lot of those lights they use just wash the colors right out. And it's hard to tell. So this being done in the daytime, we'll be able to get a good look at that first wall section and then see if any adjustments need to be made. But I think the folks from Hunt Valley, they understood what we were talking about. So yeah, kind of guys really those guys are all those groups. And they did McIntyre, mm -hmm. so it's the same. Yeah, right. Okay, good. <coughs> yeah, it's the same group that did McIntyre, that did Rio, that will do Burkmar, yeah. that is doing uh, the are they, are they doing Hillsdale as well? They are. Okay, good. All right, any other questions? All right, Jeanette, I think you're up next. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon, everyone. 
our same activities that continue to go on. So we've done a little bit more of the undercut and filled stormwater management basin that is north of Greenbrier. There's a little activity going on there. We're going to really step up our activity in the next few weeks and really get this moving. Um, one of the things we've been focusing on is completing the Alpharmal County Service Authority sanitary line in Greenbrier. As of next week, we should be out of there. So we're just finishing with testing, tying in to the existing system, finishing up the patch along Greenbrier. So again, the flaggers should be leaving next week. There is a Laurel's waterline tie-in that's scheduled for tonight from 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. And we've been working with the Laurel because it does require shutting off their water for that four-hour period. We're doing some fine grading and installing, and installing under drain between Pepsi and the post office so that now that we finished the retaining wall, we can move to the roadway section. We're placing riprap at abutment A. We're also forming and pouring abutment A back wall. We finished installing all the girders, so now we need to do the back wall in order to proceed with um, further work on the deck. We are also preparing and installing curb at Line Drive, as well as preparing for sidewalk and shared use paths on the Homewood Suite section between Whole Foods and India Drive. We're tying both of those ends together, the curb tie-ins at Whole Foods and India, and we've been doing a lot of temporary seating and trying to um, address some ENS measures. We had another inspection done by our city inspectors. We're going to be doing a SWIP inspection soon, so stormwater pollution prevention plan. We're going to be reviewing that as well, so we're just making sure that we're doing what we need to do regarding erosion and sediment control. So this is a picture of, you can see the girders that we placed. There are five of them. Those are all done. And then you can see a little bit of our rock pattern peeking out for one of the abutments, abutment B. Uh, we chose a little different pattern than what you're used to seeing. So not the dry stack stones, but more of a rounded cobblestone called Zion stone for some reason. But that was the form ladder that we chose. Zion? Zion. 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 Yes, I don't know why, but okay. I have to add that to our palette. <laughs> yes, there you go. Just trying something different so we don't Yeah, you're good. And again, here's a picture of the of the bridge. So again, it's coming together. You see some of the rip routes that we keep placing. And you can see why we're peeling. So a little exposed dirt out there. And then this is the new section of Hillsdale. And you can even see some sidewalk has already been poured. We've had the curb up, the sidewalk back there, and we're ready to do the shared use path. So that's wonderful. And the lane closures, so line drive, that's a major focus that we've been working on another two weeks, what we're looking at out there for that closure to be opened back up. All the business detour signs are in place. We got one call from Hampton Inn that people were using their parking lot as a cut through. So we placed a jersey barrier there and haven't had any complaints then. So that's been really great. How about your communication with those businesses since you've had these closures and you put the signs up? I haven't heard anything that, yeah. from the six of the businesses that truly had their access disrupted and people have to go around. So I okay. haven't heard so anything. So communications there have worked out well and they know what the deal is. Exactly. I gave okay. them the detour maps and let them know ahead of time okay. and I'll be doing that when we do the roundabout next month. So. Again, we're going to see a lot more activity at the stormwater basin north of Greenbrier. We're going to be working on installing the stormwater system at Pepsi Place. It's really at the mouth of Greenbrier. Um, a lot of the communications that you saw in the past that was from the senior center. So we'll be posting no parking signs. We'll be letting the senior center know. We're going to try and limit operations, but we are going to remove some parking so we can keep the flow on Pepsi Place working a little bit better. We take away the off-street parking on one side. We're trying to speed it up, but maintain access. We're going to be installing the coping on the retaining wall and also doing the aggregate space for 
the new roadway between Pepsi and the post office. We're installing two small retaining walls. They're kind of knee high. One is interior to the post office parking lot to make sure that the little bit of parking lot that we touch is put back the way it should be. And then there's also going to be a retaining wall holding up the parcel off of the sidewalk. We're going to start doing that. It will have the same treatment as the bridge. So even though they're small, we're going to do a little bit of treatment there to make it look nice. Um, we are going to form and pour abutment A back walls for A and B. So that should be done in the next two weeks. We're going to just be continuing installing stormwater drainage, conduit, shared use path, curb, and asphalt base in the parking lot of Seminole Square. So that's the portion that where the shopping center has been cleaved. We're going to rough grade in front of big lots and marshals. We're going to be extending the um, roadway in, accommodating the shared use path. We've uh, fixed or relocated some sanitary sewer there. So that is going to be on the big lots marshall side. We're going to have that work. Then you'll see us working on the other side of the uh, roadway in a bit. And we're going to pave and reopen line drive in what looks to be about two weeks. So in the meantime, it will be closed. We're doing the best we can to speed that up so we can close things down and build the road. So are there any questions or concerns? Question about bridge curves. I could, or were they, are they getting painted? They are not. Okay. The, the, ends, the exterior version. They've already been like yeah. powder coated, I believe. Oh, okay. They're actually like ours on Barkmore, they're painted. That's what I was wondering, actually. Are they going to be sort of matching? Yeah. I don't think so. I think what it, okay. what you saw is what the gray. Is there. That, yeah, the gray primer? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Okay. Yeah. We're trying to make the bridge look nice. I think you can kind of see it. Here. Yeah, the first five feet is usually painted, and then the fascia girders painted. Okay. Everything else underneath is not. We're trying so to think, yeah. That color, it looks kind of greenish to me. Oh, uh, okay. I think it's supposed to be gray. It's supposed to be gray. Okay. So I'll, I'll take a look. Maybe it just, right. just didn't come up in the photo. Maybe it's just a photo. Yeah. yeah. We're trying to pay attention to the aesthetics, even though right now, if everything stays the way it is, no one really sees it this bridge okay. behind the shopping center, the Pepsi plant, and the post office. All right. But we're trying to plan for the future. Thanks, Jeanette. I, I know that the uh, Kroger expansion is going to start soon. I don't know that it has yet, but do you anticipate any conflicts with Roundabout and their activities? It was supposed to start in October. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> For like six months behind. <laughs> I have continuously tried to keep my thumb on the pulse of that. They don't have a demo permit yet. That's the first step. So I haven't heard anything, but certainly during the site plan approval process, I made certain to let them know that we take precedence, that not only our plan takes precedence, anything that they had planned that we would come back and change, we might already have been done. But also, definitely taking this temporary construction easement, you can't be in this. We're going to definitely work with you to coordinate activities. All of their construction, if they were to start with the roundabout, closing off access, they'll still be able to get in and out on some square signal. Do you feel like there's any more coordination that needs to take place there? No, I mean, it sounds like it might work out in yeah. favor since they're delayed. So you might be done. Yeah. <laughs> Hope it. Hope. Okay. Not to mention the contractors have an unwritten code, sort of. We had similar things with uh, on Rio with the Texas Roadhouse as well as CBS. And they both work really well. All three of them work really well together. Accommodate. Yeah, without right. us getting involved. I mean, yeah. You're, you're <laughs> better for us to back away. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, on uh, on budget, still everything tracking tracking well. Uh, one and a half a million dollar invoice on the all three of the design build. 
projects. And just a reminder that that $1.3 million sitting in exposure is the additional incentive for finishing by October October 30th. Uh, not for the, yeah, by June 30th. By June 30th, because they re baselined their schedule. That's exactly right. So, with that re baselining and changing the moving up the contract completion date, the contractor is now taking the risk to meet that date to get that incentive. And uh, speaking as somebody that's spent most of my career in the private sector, I really admire those guys for. For doing for doing that, so that's a, that's a good deal. It also tells you they got to have a pretty good plan and feeling about finishing by by June thirtieth. Being and a construction project taking longer has never resulted in better, so that's uh, that's good. Uh, nothing changed on uh, on Best Buy. Frankly, I keep, I keep waiting for us to see this little. Yeah. Bobble cleaned up, and maybe I'll give you a shout, John. And I'm sure there's a number somewhere that can clear that clear that up. Um, and Joel's going to talk about adaptive signals uh, here in just a little bit, but no new expenditures there. Uh, about six hundred twenty-five thousand dollars processed on uh, on Hillsdale. This number changed, and actually, I should have noted that change in that in that box. I'll pick that up. But I just want to, if you pay attention to note three, the Hills, and Jeanette pointed this out, the Hillsdale construction value includes $104,000 of a city utility betterment. It now includes a uh, change order uh, and an anticipated expenditure for, uh, excuse me, and the approved change orders for Hillsdale includes the $350,000 incentive that's been put in place. And if you remember that, 150 to finish the roundabout in 30 days and 200 to and on time, 150 to finish the roundabout in 30 days and finish on time and $200,000 to finish by September 30th instead of October 30th. So that's in the change order number. And the anticipated uh, expenditures at completion also includes an additional $297,000 for that betterment, the Apple, uh, Applemont County Sewer Authority that, uh, that Jeanette referenced earlier. So even though some of that work, 104,000 to 297,000, are, are betterments, they are included in that contract value, and we wanted to make sure we, we reflected that. The long and short of it, there's nothing there that really is surprising or should be concerning. Joel is going to take us through item eight and item nine. Item eight is the uh, access management policies. You've all asked for a review of those. And item nine will be an update on this little change in direction on phase two of the SIGMA program. All right, thank you. So, yeah, I think uh, in a previous meeting wait, we were asked. Oh, oh, sorry. Wait a minute. Yeah, we have big there, announcement. There's important business. Oh, I, if, if everybody doesn't know, I know Virginia won that game today. <laughs> you should not know that. <laughs> Debbie told me. <laughs> Debbie told me. <laughs> it's contract, <and> she's allowed. <laughs> All right. So, uh, at one of the previous meetings, there were some questions on Berkmar Drive and access to future development on it. So, uh, I think access management came up, and people want to know what will the management of uh, entrances and intersections on that road be. I think uh, to start off with talking about access management, you got to start talking about the functional classification of roads because access management is based on the functional classification and the speed of roads. So. When you look through the network of roads, you have these these are major functional classifications, starting with interstate, which is your highest highest classification, principal arterial, minor arterial, major collector, minor collector, and local, local being your lowest. And most trips, like on your interstate is going to serve mostly higher speed, longer distance trips, 
Uh, and as you go down, you go you go to lower speeds, um, high mobility for your high functional classifications, and low access, low mobility, and high access. So basically, if you're going to take a trip, you're going to probably start out on a local or a collector road, work your way up through the networks to where you get on a principal arterial or a uh, even an arterial or an interstate. That's going to be the bulk of your trip, and then you wind back down to your your uh, final location back to a collector or a local road. So basically, the, the the idea is that high mobility, low accessibility, they maximize mobility, and local roads maximize accessibility. 29 is a principal arterial. 29 is a principal arterial. There's sections of 250 that are principal arterial. Obviously, 64 is our interstate. Um, Burkmar is a major collector road. Other major collectors are Hillsdale, um, Hillsdale, Burkmar, Commonwealth. Minor collectors, Milton, Angus, Woodbrook. Rural minor collectors are like Advanced Mills Road and Free Union Road. Just to kind of give you some examples. So back in 2007, Virginia actually, General Assembly, uh, guided VDOT or directed VDOT to come up with access management standards. And those access management standards had the goals to reduce congestion, uh, lower the number and severity of crashes, that's through good access management, uh, preserve the capacity of the roadway, support economic development by one, having good accessibility where appropriate and also having good mobility where you need to limit accessibility and providing good access, good and reasonable access to the highway system. In order to, to, to accomplish those goals, VDOT basically established five major criteria. And uh, the first one, keeping entrances out of the functional areas of intersections and interchange routes. So what's the functional area of the, ramp, of the intersection? Typically, it's where your auxiliary lanes start. Your right and left turn lanes will start from your roadway, and they will go through an intersection to a point not too far downstream from that intersection on all approaches that intersection. That's your functional area. You, don't, you generally want to keep entrances out of those functional areas because it causes confusion, additional conflicts, and problems with safety. Um, so that's the first one. The second one, you want to share entrances whenever you can. If you have two adjacent properties with similar uses, try and get them to share an entrance on their property line or some sort of access easement through one property to the next. Uh, provide vehicular and pedestrian circulation between land uses. If you have two neighborhoods, it's better to have someone flowing from one neighborhood to the next without coming on a higher functionally classified road to go out of a neighborhood to 29, back into a neighborhood. Brook Hill was a great example of uh, good accessibility. We saw a lot of things come together between Polo Grounds Road um, and Route 29 and the, and the school system and some commercial use there. Uh, controlling traffic movements and entrances. This is one where we talk about throat lanes. If you're not familiar with throat lanes, it's when you go into an entrance, if you are going to make a turn left or right, as soon as you get into that entrance, within just a few feet. It's very confusing. There can be parking coming in and out, and it can cause backups on the main line. So you want to have a protected throat lane until you can get the vehicles off of that road and safely in and out of that entrance. And then the most popular one here is complying with spacing standards. The spacing standards are how close can you have things like signals, entrances, and intersections. And the next, the next slide, and I think the last slide, is just talking specifically about Burkmar Drive. It's the major collector road. 35 miles an hour, and it has the, uh, the uh, characteristics that we're looking for. Signalized intersection would be no closer than 660 feet. And I would not expect that you're going to have a signal every 660 feet on Burkmar. I just don't think you would need it, but that would be the closest that you'd want to have signals so they properly work together at that speed. Um, signalized intersections to full access intersections or other full access intersections. That means a signal to a full access or a full access to a full access. Those would be at 440 feet. Full access to any other full or, let's see, full access entrances to, yeah, non-signalized full access to full access is 335. So there's not a signal, it's 335. And a partial access to any other type of entrance, 250. Now, partial access is any, any restricted movement. It could be restricting just the left in or just the left out or something like that. But any restriction would be partial access. So that's what we Joe, expect. help me understand those numbers just to... Signalized intersections spaced at 660. Yeah, I think you really need to convert that to miles. It's an eighth of a mile, I think. Well, I don't, I don't know if that's helping me. But it's <laughs> 660, then what's 440? Signalized Why they are what they are? spaced at 660. 660 is signalized intersection, signalized intersection. Right. Okay, and what's 440? That's if you have a signalized intersection, any other full access intersection. 
that's non not signalized. Okay. It's 440. All right. All right. Okay. And then from a non signalized full access to a non signalized. And it's 335. <coughs> entrance or intersection. Non signalized. Non signalized. That's not full So the access. difference between the intersection and the entrance is an entrance is just going to come in on one side, likely, and the intersection is going to go across the road. Okay. For instance, that would be between the roundabout and the Sands Club Mission. Yeah. Okay. That's a full access right. entrance to an intersection. All right. Okay. So, so those are minimum distances. So in the worst case scenario, we're going to have traffic signals every eighth of a mile, every 660 feet. Um, how do you... Well, I wouldn't look at it. It could have them every 660 feet. I would look at it if there was a signal put on Perkmore for some reason, another one would not be permitted within 660 feet, if even warranted. So how do you... Somebody comes in, how do you all work to make it, try to minimize the number of signalized intersections? Does somebody automatically do a traffic light if they're proposing an entrance that's going to be above a certain number of vehicles coming in and out? That's it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to plan for. I mean, they the only still have to meet the signal warrants. They still have to be, at the first time, you have to meet the signal warrants. warrants. So the volumes have to be significantly high to meet those warrants. Um, if someone were to come in, like a private development, like a rezoning or something, I think if the rezoning you, is really where you do the planning for that project and you determine what is going to be acceptable and what's not going to be acceptable. And that's where... And you have a good idea if you need signals at that point. And that's where the county and talking about, you know, trying to promote shared interests, is that where, that's where you can negotiate and try to get yeah some different things going on. Well, I, I think the other thing is if, if, if this road were to be in, you know, if, if the county were to look at their comprehensive plan and have this road in there, wouldn't that somewhat define that also? Yeah, it certainly could. Um, it is interesting because uh, the county used to have a lot more discretion in this regard before the proper legislation got changed. Now, unless right. that entrance was strictly for this new development, it was just sharing in the need for this improvement. We have a lot less ability to require those or even consider um, consider that as a proffer. So it, that in that case, it really gets down to VDOT, who has, has the authority to determine whether the entrance meets your criteria or not, whether you can prove it or not. I just add the other thing you've got to think about here, as well as site distance got to add that into the equation as well. Yeah, you're going to have to you have the separation there if you don't have the site distance. Yeah. Well, with with Berkmore being a fairly a new design, yeah. getting site distance should be for yeah, for Berkmore it would be an issue. At 35 miles an hour, it's like 325. The access management uh, regulations came from a lot of years of push from some areas of the general assembly but particularly a senator from the Fredericksburg area who just long preached that there was no real connection between land use and transportation in Virginia and that there, that there needed to be. And uh, it finally resulted in this requirement for VDOT to develop and uh, adopt uh, access management regulations. And I think it was a good two to three year effort of working with the county and localities to develop what finally were promulgated as the access management regu regulations. You know, I don't, I don't know whether this immediately jumps out at everybody, but we mentioned it early on. Uh, if you drop these regulations retroactively in at RIO, I think you have got people much more excited than the GSI ever got anybody excited because we did not we did not apply this these policies there at all of those those entrances you know to the contrary actually we said we're going to keep entrances where they are we're going to keep them open we're going to make everything work with those existing business business entrances uh, and really worked hard not to disrupt any existing entrances, uh, access management not notwithstanding, on a principal arterial. 
The whole project is somewhat of an access management project. Though. The whole pro the whole project is, but in a very different way, and would be applied on a on a greenfield area to today, or a true interchange project. And I know we minced over words a lot, but uh, this is one one important reason, at least for those of us who, I guess maybe care about why we tried hard not to use that word inter interchange uh, even though you could argue well gee that's just semantics it has ramps and through lanes but were that an interchange it would would have had a very different outcome in terms of access to those businesses from the local lanes right my point in, in asking about this is simply we're not in the case of Berkeley, we're not retroactively trying to drop these standards on an already existing situation. We have a new situation where yeah. the new stretch of highway, I think to try to preserve the capacity of that roadway as much as possible, the investment that was made in that should be, I know these are sort of minimum standards, but I guess what I'm saying is encouraging the, the county and VDOT to work together to use their discretion to try to duplicate or share entrances as much as possible and, and think about ways that we can exceed these these minimums. Uh, just as I said, to try to preserve as much capacity on that road as possible. And, and I think these standards are in place to tell the development community what the rules are. Here's what we've established. Here's what we're going to go by. You make your decisions based on these rules. So that we either say yes or no based on these rules and nothing else. But you still have to meet signal warrants. You yeah. still have to meet uh, site distances. Yeah. There are still other other criteria right. that, that are going to be considered. And really, it comes back to to what's being zoned for what for what uses. Uh, it's just not well. There's a road. Let's put a signal pole up every six sixty feet because yeah. this is also good. this is also. Yeah. A, I mean, yeah. you know, we say signalized intersections. So being the, the, the top intersection out there, but it doesn't really consider other alternate type of intersections around about or something like that also. But you would also look at if the traffic lines were correct. So yeah, you wouldn't automatically do a signal. You look at alternate you would look at other other types there's of a number of intersections you and I both know of where yeah. there's actually uh proffers or commitments to put in signals if the warrants are met, then they just they've been sitting there for years. Sitting there for years and they're not coming close to the warrant. Right. And we have a twenty year old proffer at Rio and Puck Puck Place. Yep. Still doesn't meet warrants. We look at it every year. Yep. Okay. All right, the next item, the uh, the adaptive uh, signal, phase two. So we've been working with our traffic folks past couple months I, I guess to talk about implementing phase two of the adaptive signal and We've had some changes in technology for signals actually since adaptive uh, since the adaptive project was funded. So back uh, in 2015, the FHWA and VDOT still uh, promoted the use of uh, adaptive signal control technology, and I think that was just I, when was this was approved? 2014 or uh, like 2015. Two, so, well, 2014 time. is when we approved the. Uh, 2014, yeah. we approved the funding. So at that time, this was the, that that adaptive signal technology was what was being promoted by the FHWA and VDOT. Uh, since that time, starting in 2016 and 17, we've kind of shifted gears and seen that there's better technology out there. It's called the Automated Traffic Signal Performance Measures, and it's actually what you saw when you went and visited the uh, the Traffic Operations Center out in Stanton last year sometime. And Grant talked to us about what he was doing with the signals out there. Uh, the things that are similar about these two systems is they both rely heavily on very good communications between the signals and on the corridor and um, controllers that can talk to each other. And we got that with phase one. That was all put in in phase one. That was the bulk of the investment in the signal system. That's all in place now. Where we're looking to, um, what, what we're looking to do with the change in technology, we can better manage that corridor with the uh, AS. ATSMPs, the Automated Traffic Signal Performance Metrics, and I'm just going to call it performance metrics at this point because it's a lot easier. Uh, so we're talking about shifting what we're going to do and keeping what we have in place. Everything we've done so far uh, is, is working and it's usable for this new technology. 
what, it, what the difference was was the software that we installed on our servers um, to allow us to use this new technology uh, is where the shift is. So basically, we've determined that we can better manage the traffic on the corridor, Route 29 corridor, with this new technology, and that's the direction we plan on going here with everything we've got in place. Move on to the next slide. Uh, one of the concerns with us doing this is we have the city project, which is also the adaptive signal technology. So we've been meeting with the city actually over the past three weeks. We've had three meetings with them. And uh, what we've decided was um, the city county boundary is not such a great place to divide maintenance, op maintenance uh, areas for the best operation of the 29 corridor. So we've been talking about going to an agreement with the city and VDOT to, uh, to better manage our signals as you go down through the whole corridor and actually into the city also. Uh, so far, the discussions have been that VDOT is going to operate these signals right here, the, the Angus Road signal, the Bourne Road signal, which we were planning on doing that after the Best Buy ramp was done yet, but that uh, agreement has not been executed. But if you look, we have a map later on, and we'll show you why the divide is different. We're also going to look at operating these two signals here, because it really is uh, pulls the whole system kind of together, and it makes it work as one system. And those will all be managed and operated under the new technology that we're you said we're going to look at operating those last two. We're, we're going to. We're going. We're, yeah. we're right now. We're developing an agreement, so we will be. Operating. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's been. Got it's you. a verbal agreement now, and we're working on the uh, yeah. the written agreement okay. at this point. Can you also look at adding Hillsdale and Seminole? Because you're going to operate. It is. Hillsdale is that not on there? No. Hillsdale and Seminole. Because of how close it is to 29 that you operate, how close it is to the hydraulic in Hillsdale, and then the next one up would be Rio and Hillsdale. So get that whole corridor with the same thing. Yeah, we'll speak with Rio. Yeah. Can you circle back to the city on that? Yeah. Okay. All right. So. Uh, and moving forward, so that's the plan that we'll take. We'll, we'll operate those signals under the new technology. The city has to decide how they're going to pursue their adaptive signal or their, their upgrade of their signals for the remaining signals in the original scope. And uh, just because we think that the, uh, the uh, performance metrics is best for the VDOT system, it may or may not be the best for the city. And they're looking into options. Actually, the last meeting we went to, uh, I took the city out to the Traffic Operations Center last Friday, Tony Edwards and... Uh, and Gigi and Brendan Duncan and Jeannie Alexander, and they saw the two systems working together, the adaptive and the uh, performance metrics, so they could kind of see what the advantages and disadvantages might be. Because you have two different types of uh, networks of roads there. And you also have, um, the city would have to allocate some resources, possibly a little bit differently, and make those decisions if they're going to move forward with going to the new technology. Both of them will be an improvement. Uh, it depends on the, what resources you allocate. So. Uh, all in all, we think that the collaborative approach of VDOT and the city working together, removing the jurisdictional boundary and really looking at the ge geographical area of where the signals are will allow us to manage the overall signal operations a lot better in the whole area. And the last, the last slide we have is just kind of a map. The green stars are what um, VDOT will be managing, operating those signals there. The, uh, the red dots are the remainder of the signals that are in the city system. And that's the one that they're, they're really working hard now to determine what, um, how they're going to move forward with the operations of those. Now, with their project, with the, new, with the signals that VDOT will be operating up there, they'll still, with their project, upgrade those signals, get the communications, and get the, uh, get the controllers in there so they operate very well with the existing VDOT signals. But so they'll be doing the same thing we did with Phase 1. They're, they're going to be doing the Phase 1 for those, and you have to do the phase one for all of them, really. You have yeah. to get communications up. Now, whether they use radio communications down here or not, I think we've already determined we have, we have fiber up. We have fiber up along hydraulic road already. And you'll circle back on Jeanette's comment. Yes. So okay. I think we're upgrading to the adaptive system on Hillsdale Seminole. So mm -hmm. if anything needs to change, that'd be good to know. Yeah. So, I apologize, I just want to make sure I'm digesting and understanding all of this. So the way I understood it in my head was that phase one is where we went in and we put in 
the necessary equipment so that the lights can be controlled remotely. And I remember there was a real advantage to doing that before construction of the rest of the project started because it allowed folks in Stanton to sort of make changes. The communication. Yes. Right. But the, the signals at that point, the separate signals weren't communicating with each other. They weren't sending information back and forth. There was the expert sitting in Stanton kind of figuring it all out. My understanding was phase two was the software that those traffic signals would then begin communicating with each other and sort of directing the traffic and platoons in the most efficient way. Yeah. If I understand you correctly, what you're saying is the phase two, we still have phase two, it's just the technology, but the software is going to be different. Well, I think you have to look at phase two. You could look at the, tech, the, the software that we're using that we actually put in with phase one. It was actually free software. It was developed in Utah. Funded by the, it's not free. It was funded by the FHWA, so we paid we, for we, it. We paid, we paid for it somehow. <laughs> but we, we paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's the, what we were previously thinking you mean. Yeah. So the, the difference is, so the way the way the corridor works is basically you analyze. You put, the first phase put out a bunch of detection, video detection and, and loop detection out there, and the communications because you can't do anything. You can't get the corridor working well without knowing what's going on. First of all, each, each intersection and having good communication between the intersections and good communication back and, and analysis capabilities. The difference now is the analysis. So you, you collect all this data and you see how your corridor is performing. You set it up on a timing system. We talked about the green bands and stuff like that. You set up on the timing system and you can analyze that performance. Now, with the adaptive technology, the adaptive is it takes all that data in and a computer, a computer that makes these decisions on how to get that traffic to flow, okay? The performance metrics is you get all that data in and it sets alarms to the engineer, basically, that says you're performing well here, you're not performing well here, you're doing, you know, you could do better on this section. And that person makes those decisions on when those alarms go off, how to make those changes versus a computer. One of the issues we've seen with the adaptive system is that computer, we don't have the ability, it's, it's proprietary, so we can't go in and reprogram that computer like we can with the other technology. So the decisions that the computer are making, if we don't agree with those decisions or they're not the best thing for the corridor, we can't do much about that. With the performance metrics, if it, we make the decisions on what to do. So you have an engineer making a decision versus a computer making a decision. And what we've seen in our experience on Pantos with the adaptive is the computer doesn't always make the best decision. Uh, we feel that we can have a lot better performance on the corridor. Corridor wide. Corridor wide by analyzing it. Because what's interesting is, if you, if you remember, we went and we saw the TOC, he can pull up any time of day and see how that core is performing. Like, when we were there last Friday, we had a complaint from the day before. You know, 6.45 in the morning or 8.15 in the morning, I hit all the red lights. Well, Grant can look at a 15-minute increment or any time during the day, and he said, well, on the southbound 29 corridor, I was hitting 83%. Uh, Eighty-three percent of the traffic was hitting green lights as they progressed through the corridor. He can he can see how that happens all times of day. He made some changes in the midday, which we're having trouble with the midday still. And he saw that only sixty-five percent are hitting that green band in the midday. We know we have some work to do in the midday. We don't have that. We can't tweak the system with the adaptive. We feel as as we can with the uh, the performance metrics. The we way I understand the way I understand it after more than one long conversation <laughs> is that there's part of me that said, let's don't ever bring this up because it's going to be very confusing. The other part of me said that's exactly the wrong, the wrong thing to do because we talk so much about the adaptive signals. At least the way I understand it in my brain is you still have this additional data collection analysis that's going to take place just like it was going to take place in phase two. The, di the difference being the output of that analysis is going to be measured by a human who's, who's responsible for looking at the performance measurements and then using the adaptive signal technology that we put in in phase one, well, communication, yeah. communications uh, capabilities that we put in phase one, be able to adjust the, the court. And on a given day, that adjustment may be different depending on, on what's happening. It may be more responsive uh, in terms of the uh, concentrated periods of, of congestion or special events. I think the piece that Joel said that registered with 
me was the prior technology kind of went into this box and it did its it did its thing and it it may or may not be the best thing for any given moment. Yeah, and let me let me data. let me add on to that just a little bit, just to make sure that we're we we could actually go in and put the adaptive in at any time still. It's all set up that it could be installed. Because if you remember, that more or less was, in, again, in simple terms, we could put it in. Pl plugging in some components yeah. in each one of the controllers. With all the information we have coming, we could say, well, we don't want a person to do that anymore. We want the computer to do that. Put the controllers in there. Let the computer roll. And if everything that we've done so far is not wasted. Um, it would cost us $35,000 more for intersection to do that at this point. So we're not losing anything by not doing it, especially if we get better performance out of the system. But we're um, not spending that thirty five thousand dollars that we had budgeted yeah. when this budget was approved back in July of twenty fourteen. We're not spending. I think it's I think three thousand. It was three thousand dollars per controller. Yeah. With the performance metrics, yeah. plus another thirty five thousand to put the adaptive on yeah. top of that. Plus these cost of installation. I think I think all in all, we're going to get a better product out of it. Thank you. We have a brand switch us with a computer. <laughs> Joel, thank you for for going through that. Uh, I don't have any any uh, new business. Chip Morgan. Well, I think we're done. Oh, actually, I should have brought up because you said the thing around about re yeah, Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Uh, you know, we have the second and fourth Thursdays. The second and fourth Thursdays for the hydraulic panel. The third Thursday for for this panel. Uh, and I, I think what we saw pretty quickly just in the last seven days that three meetings back back to back uh, is more effort than we an anticipated. Uh, for, and I'll put myself in that category, but for 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 all of us, it's a lot of days time. It's a lot of Joel's of uh, Joel's time uh, just to prepare and uh, and and get ready. What we thought might be an option uh, was to, particularly as the other, as Burke Martin Route 29 widening wind down, would be to convene this panel on one of the Thursdays that the other panel meets. And since the other panel, the hydraulic panel, of course, three or four of you here today are on the hydraulic panel. Uh, that um, that the hydraulic panel we'd keep it two and meet convene this panel maybe in the in the morning uh, if that if that works if, if it doesn't work then then we'll keep keep on doing what we're what we're doing Kristen is good with the fourth Thursday in the morning Brad is good with the fourth Thursday in the morning but I I don't know about I don't know about you all. Did you say morning? Are you envisioning ten to eleven? Well, what I was envisioning by morning is assuming people did not want to meet through the lunch hour, which doesn't bother me at all. So I was presuming sometime before noon, rather than trying to meet. I don't think one to two is a good idea. Because as Hillsdale gets more into things, you know, there may be things to talk about there. And I don't want to give short shrift. It's great that Rye's done. It's great that Bergmar and 29 Winding are going to be done early. But we're not finished. We're not finished, <laughs> you know. And I don't want to, I, I don't, I'm not in favor of putting Hillsdale into the hydraulic panel because there, you're there to talk about land, land use, a small area plan, and say, well, we got this small area planning we're doing, and oh, by the way, we've got a road over here under construction. Just doesn't ring, ring right with, with me. So by morning, I, for me, you know, 
6 a.m. on is right. is good. From my vantage point, I don't mind consolidating the meetings, but it would be more convenient if they're closer together as opposed to further apart. Like a two hour gap in the middle where yeah. it really makes sense to go back to the office. And kind of right. I'd, I'd love to do like 12 to 1 or something and break for an hour for lunch. I think as much as I want to do instead of 12 to 1. As opposed to starting at like nine or ten, and then okay. having to yeah, take up the whole I would day. agree. That's that's better for me. The okay. other thing I was going to suggest is plan on meeting for that for the next three months. That gets us to June, and then let's revisit whether we meet how all frequently we. Yeah, meet. yeah. Well, we were sort of on that path any anyway. Yes. Yeah. Well, Twelve to one is fine with is fine with me. I mean that doesn't. But, doesn't matter to me. I don't think it's a good idea to move the hydraulic panel later than two. I don't. I don't believe. I don't think we want to get into that. Was twelve to one something that would work with you? Would that work with you, Chip? I, it'll yeah, it'll definitely work. I'm just thinking if if we run into something twelve to one. Then we start pushing right into the two o'clock. Yeah, I mean, look at today. Just today, eleven eleven thirty. Well, today we're at an hour and a half with, uh, you know, and and we're going to have, we're going to have a big chunk of the updates are going to are going to blip away. Uh, I hear you about if we run into something, if we run into something substantive. Then it may be an item that we need to roll over into a meeting anyway. But that, there again, the, the times, like, if it's after six o'clock in the morning, I'm good. <laughs> so 12 to 1, 12 to 1, you think you should float that, Chip? Is that Chris? Henry? <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me just float that back to the let me float that back to the group. If we make a change before April twentieth, cool. If we don't, we'll be here on April twentieth. I I am not looking for any reason to shortcut the process just out of convenience. I am cognizant of the fact that there, even though work is winding down, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, and I know Dave and his team and, and Joel and John's got an entire district to run. I probably should have thought through that perhaps a little a little better before we set that timing up. But one other thing that occurs to me is in June, once these projects wrap up, I mean, right now it's, it's a little bit slow, but I would imagine when do these projects open up and people start using them, particularly Burkmar, we'll probably get a fair number of comments coming in about... Yeah. Sure. There's things sticking up off the road. Sure. Signs blocking my view. I would think the first meeting or two after these projects are done, we may have. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, let me. Uh, we could do 11:30 if it provides a little bit of. I, mean, I hear what you're saying. I'm thinking. A yeah, bit I, of I, I, that, that's a, that's a pretty good point. And I don't want to say. I don't want to cut off a conversation. Right. And say, hey, look, we got other people coming in here. <laughs> That's not good business. And uh, the, we've worked too. We've worked too hard not to get ourselves in a point where we're shortcutting, uh, where we're shortcutting the conversation. Uh, let me just float that back back out because it's important <laughs> to how every uh, one else feels. I know. I think Karen is is busy on other stuff now and. Pete is Pete's still keeping keeping tabs on things. I can uh, I can assure you that. And hearing from Henry is important to me because he's put a lot of he's put as much time in and effort as as the rest. So uh, I'll run out the flagpole, and if it changes in April, I'm going to do that pretty soon because if there's going to be a change, I want Debbie to get that out on the website so we can push that, and uh, Lou can push that pretty pretty hard. That would take. I mean, I'm sure coordinating with the RPT. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll work that out with with our invited guests. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. We'll see how it goes. Hey, thank you, uh, thank you a lot for your for your time, and I'll see you next week.
Yeah. <laughs> yeah.